All right. Hello, everyone. My name's Robin, and I'm here to talk to you about spooky ghosts in the middle of spring, because ghosts don't care what season it is. So we're going to be talking about this word, shunenbukai, and it's going to sound actually really similar to Marcy's talk, but like in Japanese. But don't worry, it's in translation. We're going to learn about this fascinating gentleman on the left um, who is a poet scholar and he's a mild-mannered poet scholar. The emperor really liked him. And we're gonna learn how he became deified as a patron of scholarship after intense betrayal and exile. But first, again, let's talk about language. What is spite? What's vengeance? The term shunenbukai can actually be translated as vindictive, tenacious, persistent, spiteful, vengeful. So it's a pretty nice multi-purpose word for these occasions. So it does hearken the question, why are there so many ways to translate it? Also, just want to note, this is literally the first word that came up when I was looking up spite in the Japanese dictionary, so please don't use it to like try and impress people in Japanese. It's not really how it works. <laughs> um, so charts are very helpful, and it seems I also have a spitometer. So to help illustrate this adventure into translation and spite, I've created this little graph here that I'd like you all to refer to as we go along. On our x-axis is the Japanese time period. On the y-axis, the spitometer, or the level of malice that's related to the translation. So let's begin. Once again, we're going to come back to this gentleman. Do not worry. You, ha you don't have to remember this name. It's very long. Um, his name is Sugawara no Michizane. And um, he's a pretty well-respected poet scholar, like I said, in the Heian court. So this is super, super early, around early 900s. Um, the capital at the time was Kyoto, and he'd gained the favor of one of the emperors. Super cool. Of course, because it's politics, stuff went down. Then he got betrayed because his position was super awesome. And then one thing led to another until he was exiled from Kyoto all the way down to Dazaifu. I'm assuming people do not know where that is, so... Uh, oh, that's also just a headline. You'll learn more about this in just a moment. <laughs> Trees. So maps. I was really excited to put this in here. It's my first time here. Um, Kyoto's on the left, Dazaifu's on the right. It doesn't look like it's very far because it's Japan and Japan is small. Um, but to give you a sense of it, I did the math for you. Uh, it's about 402 miles. They had ox carts. That's about two miles per hour. It's about eight days. Was not an easy trip to make at the time. So, in the Zaifu, I don't know if I can get a ship on here. He probably could have. Well, we'll see. So he wasn't allowed to go back to Kyoto, which was not fun for him. He loved that place. That was like his home. He had his favorite cherry blossom tree and his favorite plum blossom tree in his backyard. And sadly, he died in Dadzaifu, and his last poem that he wrote before his death was about him wishing that he could just smell the plum blossoms one more time in Kyoto. So sad. So sad. But here comes the crazy part. Let's just go back really quick to Kyoto's imperial palace. Some very interesting things happened right after his death. So shortly after his death, these things happened in super quick succession. Plague, drought, death of the emperor's sons. By the way, this is a different emperor, the one who didn't like him and exiled him. So, ooh, that's weird. Um, the main hall got struck, not once, but multiple times by lightning. Uh, and then there were weeks of massive rainstorms and floods. So the folks at the capital somehow traced all of this nonsense and misery back to the time of Sugawara no Michizane's death. So of course, they were like, it's his angry spirit. We have to fix this. Uh, and to do that, they built a shrine and uh, he was deified as a god of education. Um, today, you can still visit this shrine called Kitano Tenmangu in Kyoto. You can pray to him, to his new name, Tenjin, which is Sky God, for a good grade on your exams, because that's what you do. <laughs> Not study, just pray, exactly. Um, <laughs> that'll do it. So, let's just go back to the spider mirror. This was more just of a practice round given that he didn't really seem to mean it at all. He just wanted to smell his cherry blossoms again. Um, he's on the very bottom of the spite scale, uh, but it goes to show you that sometimes it's nice when people assume things, because then you too may be deified. 
All right, but now let us go into our next actual literary character, Kiyohime, from the play Dojoji, still around the same time period. Um, if her story were a crazy newspaper headline, this would be it. Uh, I'm full of these stories, by the way. They're going to take up too much time. I can't tell them all here. Um, but all you need to know <laughs> is that she got super mad that a hot dude ghosted her, and that's hilarious in punny ways. Uh, and that rage turned her into a serpent demon, as you do. Uh, then she chased him, going like, oh, hell no! And then she accidentally killed him. So, oops. Um, now, on the spite scale, she is slightly higher, because she really was mad. Uh, she really did have intent to go and like push her there. Um, but again, she didn't really like mean to kill him. So, based on the version you read, by the way, depends. Um, the theme of this period of translation um, is spite, because this is spite actually caused by human social rejection. Uh, so, you know, you probably didn't mean to kill anyone in terms of intent, but um, sometimes these things happen. <laughs> so now, we're gonna fast forward like 500, 600 years to the Edo period. Um, this is a time when samurai were on vogue. And we're going to talk about this exciting character named Okiku, and she's from a popular ghost story called Bancho Sarayashiki, or the Dish Mansion at Bancho. That's right. These are spooky plates that's on her hair. Uh, this is a classic story of a woman not being interested in a dude, and then she rejects him several times. This dude, who is, by the way, the samurai who owns the Dish Mansion, is not having it. He frames her for stealing one of his 10 plates, and he's all like, I'll forgive you if you go out with me. And she's like, uh, no. Um, he completely overreacts and kills her by pushing her down a well. Uh, so now she haunts her until the plate is quote unquote found. Um, the interesting thing about this is uh, if you do happen to be walking around Osaka Himeji Castle uh, and you hear some very scary counting up until nine, the way to get rid of her is by shouting 10 really fast, and she'll be like, okay, good, you found it. <laughs> so, as I mentioned, samurai, on vogue at this time. But one of the ways that people liked to vet samurai was to tell the scariest stories ever. There was a party game that was called Hyaku Monogatari, or 100 stories. Specifically, 100 spooky, scary ghost stories. Uh, and that came from the original tent of trying to scare the would-be samurai. If you can't handle a vengeful spirit, I don't think I can give you a sword, okay? You just can't get one. So, pretty vengeful, they definitely mean it. Call an exorcist like yesterday. The theme from here is uh, definitely pretty vindictive slash vengeful. Uh, everyone was trying to tell the spookiest ghost story. Ghosts here could be sated, so pretty scary. But hey, at the end of the day, if you're just trying to win what is essentially cards against humanity, but as a Japanese party game, this is how you do it. So a brief pause to introduce an actual person, not a ghost, could be a ghost now, who knows? Um, there was a severe dip in the spike graph, which I'll show you in a second, but right after the Edo period, so after samurai were a thing, um, I like to think that that dip came from this guy, Inoue Indio, who spent a lot of his university time shaming people who believed in yokai, or monsters. Why did he do that? It was two Japanese, they were in the middle of trying to westernize, and the way that we do that is with science. <laughs> yes! This is important, because remember, time is going to be affecting how we're translating the word shunenbukai. There was too much time spent looking to the future, modernizing and developing the country as much as possible to continue dallying in ghosts. So now we're gonna go ahead and just kind of come up to the general modern day. Uh, so it dipped from nothing and suddenly went up past the graph that was totally on purpose. Um, in history, we're talking about maybe a couple of world wars have happened. Um, media is becoming big and uh, Japanese culture is shifting now from rapid modernization to a newfound appreciation of the olden days. Consider, Godzilla was created in 1950 as a symbol of the destruction and fear left behind from World War II. Weird! Uh, so what does this mean for our ghosts? What does this mean for the translation of Shunen Bukkai? Pretty much present day. I don't know if you guys have ever seen The Ring. It is terrifying. Um, 
It originally came out in 1995 and in America in 1998. One of the most terrifying films I've ever seen. Uh, if you don't like horror, don't watch it. You will avoid screens for weeks. Um, for those who haven't seen it, The Ring is about a girl who was brutally murdered. Unfortunately for the rest of the world, this girl also had psychic powers, and they were so strong that not only was she haunting people, she also created a VHS that was essentially the world's worst chain mail ever. And if you don't forward it, you literally die. The ring is kind of terrifying. But what is the theme here now? We've got, you know, media now in play, and they're definitely way, way, way up on that vengeance scale in terms of spite. During this time, vengeance is now used as a tool, in horror films, for example, to mirror the anxieties du jour of a society that continues to fear death, the unknown, and technology. These are literal viral videos, okay? Whoa, yikes. <laughs> uh, note that another special thing about these ghosts is that you can't exorcise them, you're kind of stuck with them. Uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but if you watch The Ring, you can't actually exorcise her. She's kind of there forever. Oh well. So what can we learn from Shinen Bukai? We've gone from Tenjin, a deity born out of fear caused by the living, to the fear of human rejection in the Heian period, to vengeful ghosts of the Edo serving as a way to steal the samurai in a party game, and also as a form of entertainment, um, to the super scary, vengeful, unable to be satisfied ghosts of today. It has so many translations because of how culture moved these stories around. Different points in history require different interpretations of these stories because of the political and cultural things going on at the time. That's what those changes mean. Uh, to kind of end this with a little toast, um, this is a quote from The Ring or Dingu. This kind of thing doesn't, ha it doesn't start by one person telling a story. It's more like everyone's fear just takes on a life of its own. And that is essentially what a lot of ghosts are. So, you know, let's raise a glass to the reinterpretation of concepts and language and the fluidity of culture, or, or a toast to becoming accidentally deified for stuff you didn't do, but everyone thought you did. Thank you. I'm gonna skip